this is the fourth and final uh, Chromecast about the different communities that I've participated in over my life um, history. I haven't talked about this one that much. This is the end result of all the experimentation I've done in community, and uh, meaning it's the latest version, um, and it's got more complexity than all of them had, uh, and there's more capacity in me to be able to work with it as a result of all these experiments I've done. I didn't think of them at the time as experiments, but actually I did because everything in my life is. So, um, uh, so I'm going to do one that's even earlier than the others now, and this is this is the one that the first one uh, that happened when I went to New College as a teacher, uh, and that was 1972 and 73. But I want to give a tiny backstory to that, just to say that when I was a child, we had eight children. My father was a doctor. He was a very fair man. He wanted everybody to have equal opportunity. But what that meant for him was that everybody, if one person wanted something, everybody else got to have it too, which means if you wanted something and it wasn't possible to do all of the, you know, everybody having it, then you couldn't have it. So it, it tended to squash individuality. The, 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 his, his concept of fairness tended to squash individuality. I'm sure he was not aware of that. But if one was insistent, and I think I've already done a Chromecast on my, my horse, did I? Do I, do I do? <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you were insistent, then eventually you might get what you wanted. Uh, but it was a rare thing. And so, so in that case, it was individuality again and community and those two. And how do they interact with each other? The dynamic between them has always fascinated me ever since like the dynamic between any two poles of any, quote, contradiction, unquote. I'm always fascinated by the space between the two points, the space between the two poles, and how do we keep it moving so that it doesn't get too extreme in one, one direction or the other. For example, with individual and community, if you stress individual too much, it becomes um, anarchistic to the point of just, you know, everybody out for themselves. If you do community too much, it becomes um, like a cult or a commune uh, where everybody's m meshed into uh, some kind of uh, version of what you're supposed to be all together. Um, usually that has a guru or a strong state like communism um, to make sure that happens. And so the point is they both need, they, they both need the opposite to, to not be too extreme in themselves. And that is what, what we're trying to do here at... Um, Green Acres Village, and and so the first instance of my need for community came up consciously when I became a teacher at New College of California, right here. and that was after I had finished my uh, career in graduate school where I was amazingly enough successful despite my incredible um, ambition to basically um, undermine the entire history of philosophy. I don't think I've talked about that yet, but in any case, I, I got my degree as a result of the kind of dissertation I did and the synchronicities that surrounded it. And so then I, I was flying high. That's why I want to talk about that. I was flying high by the time I got to New College. And that was the time when very few people were getting hired because it was, uh, I don't know what the situation was, but... Um, very few new graduates were getting hired by colleges, and I had sent out a, a um, letter to 30 different colleges saying um, the same thing, and it was go for broke time. I decided I'll just do my own way and see what happens, and the letter started out by saying, I want to help undo what has been done to me, and I knew that most people would just not even know what I was talking about and ignore it. But I sent it out to a couple of experimental colleges. I sent it out to state colleges, to you know, fancy colleges, uh, you know, just um, community colleges. I sent it out to lots of places, and I got two responses back, three responses back that were interested. And one was new, new. It was a new college that was starting up in Massachusetts, and the guy said, you know, I would really like to hire you. Um, I really appreciate what you're doing. And unfortunately, I don't have an opening right now. Another one was Antioch College, which, by the way, died and I think is coming back to life now. And they, they flew me out there and said, we just wanted to get a look at you. Actually, we've already hired somebody who 
uh, satisfies five different affirmative action requirements. <laughs> Besides being a woman, she's black, she's a Buddhist, and something else, I can't remember what. But um, So they really appreciated my letter, but uh, and we had a great talk all day, but I wasn't hired there. So, but New College, they just, they, they had a, a, they were very new in the, in their attitude. They really had students on the hiring committee and they had a, a large say in who got hired. And so the students thought I was fantastic in, by the letter I wrote. And so uh, I was hired over 650 other applicants. I mean, it was outrageous. So I was flying high in two ways. One, because I had successfully completed the PhD especially given the kind of uh, the work I was doing for it. And two, I had had such an incredible response from the students, especially at New College. And um, New College, by the way, was only one year old when I got there. And it lasted up until 2011, I think. So that was 1972. And I think it finally died in 2011, something like that. I think the problem was always accreditation and whether they were actually satisfying the requirements. Um, and, and it was it was started by a, a priest, a Jesuit priest, who had been at, at Santa Clara College and decided to do something experimental within Santa Clara, and then Santa Clara refused it. And so then he just left and took his favorite teacher with him, and they, they got some stationery printed up, and they found a, a board of directors that were rich people, and they, who were all Catholics, and they started New College of, Calif New College of California in Sausalito on the uh, docks, uh, no, near the docks of, South, of Sausalito. Okay, and the next year it moved to San Francisco, but we're only talking about this one year. There were about 100 students there and about 10 teachers. I was the only woman. Um, that figures, of course, uh, especially back then. And I, as I said, I was flying high, so my ego was totally involved at the time, totally involved. I completely identified with my fame, even before I got there, I had I was famous, and so it was an interesting college in that they they didn't give grades, um, they didn't have large classes. It was mostly seminars of various kinds, and um, we had an interesting meeting once a week. It was called the community council, and once a week, whoever wanted to show up, and there was usually at least fifty people there. Uh, students and teachers, and we basically um, talk about education and what it really is. And there was a, it ended up being kind of a debate between especially me, who was holding one position, and this guy named Norman, who was holding the opposite position. So there's these opposites again, these contradictions, and we need to learn to how to play with them and not take, talk, take either extreme seriously. So the extreme I held was education which comes from educare, means to pull up from within. So I was very much in a Socratic, I was Socratic in my approach to education. Everybody knows everything underneath. They just have to find it within themselves. And that's, that, you know, that could be a whole podcast in itself. But his approach was for the great books. He came from the University of Chicago where the great books program was, um, I don't know if it's still there, but everybody was always reading great books. In other words, the student is a blank slate. And that's kind of how modern education is. They, they assume students are blank slates and they have to learn from the great masters or from whatever. They're learning from the outside in. And I'm going, no, you're learning from the inside out. So it was a very much a polarity. And um, it became, you know, really um, a, a big, uh, what would you call it? A, it was very energized, energizing, this, this debate that we had. And of course, then it polarized the, the, the student body and the teachers so that was one side was all for me and one side and another and half, half and half pretty much all for me and all for Norman. Okay, so, and then part of that was there was this debate, of, like we're, we're a college, but we're also a community. We're a college, but we're also a community. And everybody kept saying that, like, but we're a community. We're all here together at the same time. You know, we're all here helping and supporting each other. And then I said the fatal, I asked the fatal question, and I shouldn't have done it, but it was there. Okay, if we're all here as equals, which we were all pretending to be, why are some getting paid and some paying? And um, 
it kind of spun out from there because clearly the teachers were getting paid and the students were paying or their parents were. And so what kind of community was it? I mean, you could still have a community, but don't pretend that we're all on the same playing field because we're not. And it just shows up in the money. And so, you know, so that anytime you put money in with anything, it, it adds a whole new charge to it. And, the, and we're all still working with that. All of us in, on this planet are still working with that, no matter how enlightened we think we are. So it ended up that um, uh, I was also doing a, uh, with, with the teacher that he had brought with him to, um, to, to New College, uh, the, who, the, the Jesuit priest had brought with him, I ended up, he was my lover, we lived as students, so there was a community aspect there. And um, he and I did a, a little magazine called The Nutria. It was a little in-house magazine. And, and the editorial policy was, we print whatever we get. No edit, we don't edit anything. We don't change the spelling. We don't change, it's confused. If it's confused, it goes in confused. And the idea was that the students would start to teach each other because they'd, they'd laugh at each other if they made mistakes. And it worked. And that annoyed everybody else that it worked, all the other teachers. Because in other words, we didn't have to teach them. All we had to do is give them this experiment that they could teach themselves by everybody saying, well, that guy, you know, he didn't know what he was doing or he didn't know what he was doing. So they, it did work. The, the Nutria became a hot little item that we published. I think it was once a month, once every two weeks, something like that, on Xerox paper. And um, then we made the mistake of sending one of the issues of the Nutria to the board of directors, remember, who are rich Catholic men. And in that issue, there was a, uh, a story from one of the students who had written about the afternoon that she spent with me and another student where I had talked, I had, I used, I ended up spending most of my time in one-to-one -one sessions with students rather than even seminars. I was more one-to-one -one learning. And this, this young woman was so inhibited that I said, why don't you someday take an LSD trip? So she had done that and she'd come to my house and she brought her friend with her, with her. And she was freaking out. And so I spent the whole afternoon with her, helping her, you know, expand her awareness and uh, let go of fear, which she did. And the other, the girl that was with her wrote that all down, okay? So remember, we had no censorship whatsoever. So this goes in the Nutria. So you can imagine how the board felt about that. They were already, you know, roiled up because of what was going on at the school. So I really pushed it over the limit then. You know, I look now and I go, oh my God, what did you do? So, but all I heard was, you know, I didn't hear anything about it, but the, one of the people that lived in the house was one of the student, rep, was the student representative on the board. And I felt that he was changing and I didn't know how he was changing, but he didn't, he, it's like he wasn't being real with me and I just, I couldn't understand it. So I was starting to feel kind of paranoid and I felt more and more paranoid as the summer wrote, went on. This was after school was over. I was still living there. And then the day before school was supposed to start again, I'm on the ground listening to Aretha Franklin stoned out of my mind, no doubt. And I, all of a sudden, Anne, and there's a student who's handing me a letter. <laughs> it's handing me a letter from the uh, Jesuit priest who ran the college. And the letter, and so there I am, I read the letter, and it's a list of my sins, according to him, but actually it wasn't according to him, it was really according to anybody else. He actually supported me, uh, but it was like, resign or get fired. And he did the same thing to the teacher that was, all, that was my lover, Resign or get fired. He decided, no, he said, if you resign, they said, if you resign, we'll give you some severance pay. If you get fired, that's, that's, that's it. You're fired. So uh, I refused to resign, of course, being full of principles, uh, full of arrogance. And he chose, uh, the other guy chose to, uh, to take the resignation and the severance pay. But I managed to get unemployment, so 
I probably got about the same thing that he did. But it was a tremendous blow to my ego. It was the very first time that I had completely failed. And the thing that had brought it up, really what had started it, was this whole idea of what is a community and how does the individual fit within the community. And obviously I had gone way overboard in my own, quote, individuality inside that place, especially because it was a... Um, you know, it had a. It was a college, and you had you had accreditation issues. You had um, all sorts of uh, protocols that are that go with being a college, and so it was all getting very confused because of my attitude. Okay, I just want to do one more little thing before I want to say why this is so important right now. Um, the uh, very soon after that, I moved up to Mendocino, where I lived in a forest lodge with about 10 other people so it's another little community so this is kind of an addendum and this community had unbelievably weird people in it I mean it was just everybody was so weird everybody was coming off some kind of strange life and um, one of them was a was a woman whose husband was a doctor who had left her and now was running around town in a clown outfit can you believe it <laughs> another one was a musician, a spontaneous musician on the piano who wanted to become the governor of California and had this quixotic uh, campaign that he was on. I can't remember the others, but they all had a real quirky... Oh, another one uh, wanted to see what it was like to experience being blind, so he had taped his eyes shut and was doing that for a week at a time. Uh, and, and it was like, you know, It was like a psychedelic experience just being there. Um, with these people and we were all on the edge we were on the edge of our lives we had left left the normal world behind absolutely living in the forest near the the edge of this of the continent here uh, it was quite a quite an experience um, so that will lead me now to what's going on right now because what's interesting to me right now is why I wanted to do these community uh, Chromecast right now, I have a feeling it has to do with the astrology of right now, um, this year 2020, which is going to be ending soon at, with a, a huge womp, uh, which is going to shift everything, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this before, starting on December 21st when Jupiter and Saturn both leave Capricorn together at zero degrees, they combine and because of the declination between the two, it's zero declination also, so they're going to really look like they're one almost fused in the sky. And um, so that's why it's so important. It's going to be a, a phenomenal event. And uh, so Jupiter, the, uh, the principle of expansion and one's values, Saturn, structure, goals, you know, um, being serious. Uh, how to put those two together? So again, another contradiction. Um, and they're moving into Aquarius from Capricorn, where Pluto still is. These three have been uh, moving back and forth in a very small area of, of um, space for uh, since January, basically, since January of last year, in the, the last third of Capricorn. And Capricorn is the ruler of Saturn. It has to do with rules, goals, traditions, institutions, structures. So with Pluto there... Uh, ever since 2008, actually, and it's gotten stronger over time, especially now with Saturn there, uh, and then Jupiter joined it, expanding the whole thing. Um, it is the the basically the um, uh, what would you call it? You know, rumblings underneath of all structures, any whether visible and invisible, uh, that are just really starting to ask, make us question everything about our society. Everything that we take for granted uh, is, is up for grabs, and it's not done. Uh, but when Jupiter and Saturn move into Aquarius, Aquarius, the opposite Aquarius, is Leo. So the whole polarity between individuality and community, and we're talking a community of equals, comes up during that, during the time when Jupiter, especially, and Saturn, Jupiter for a year, Saturn for two and a half years, are in that sign, and then Pluto will also be joining them soon after that. So that will be one of the themes of Aquarius. How do we do communities of equals uh, where they're not 
vertically aligned so you, you have a boss at the top and then you know it goes down the power is at the top and then it goes down but how how to do it from the ground so that everybody is equal on the ground all uh, working with each other cooperating with each other rather than obeying each other that is going to be the the the, the wave of the future and this is what needs to happen and and yet what does that mean uh, what does that mean how do we work with this polarity so that ends my uh, my uh, four part um, uh, Chromecast on community and an individual and community or communities I have lived in, but really it's a it's kind of like a experiments in community that I have gone through, uh, which has helped me understand more and more what my own life path is, which has to do with this um, embracing of all contradictions, all all paradoxes like this, and. Um, I will be talking more and more also about this community, but um, right now, the history of it, the history of me in community is what I wanted to focus on. So that's it. Thanks.